So, uh, so this will be a, a session on sparse uh, direct linear solvers and the preconditioners. And the way we want to do this section is, uh, let me see, how do I move forward? Okay, so that's, that's the uh, very high level agenda. And we'll have uh, 75 minutes and we try to, um, f there are two parts. So one is the super LU direct solver. Another one is another uh, sparse direct solver, but the focus is more on the uh, various compression techniques uh, to get a good uh, preconditioner. Uh, so the plan is uh, we, for each part, uh, we try to get on the computer to set up the uh, software with our help so that uh, later when in a rush, uh, you still know how to work on the uh, examples. So the first five minutes, we'll do that. So as you can see, when you add up all together, it's 70 minutes, so we have some slack time. Okay, so let's see, um, for, let's set up this uh, theta GPU. So my question is, uh, after the first uh, couple of sessions, have you all started uh, using the computer? Okay, so has anyone not on the computer yet? Not a, not that uh, you haven't done the QSub onto the GPU node yet. You're all good? Okay, so then that will be simpler. <laughs> so what you do is uh, in the beginning, you uh, go to your home directory and you do a rsync from all the examples of our track to your home directory. Remember to do this dot. Don't forget this uh, dot at the end. And even if you have done that uh, earlier today, I recommend you to do that again. Uh, it, it's going to be fast because we have updated. Uh, whenever we have an update, uh, when you do this rsync, you get the latest. And after you are uh, getting the uh, examples into your home directory, then you can do the QSAP into this uh, uh, GPU. Um, we, you are allowed for 60 minutes, so that means uh, even if you get on right now, maybe in the second part of the lecture, you will need to do this again to try to get on again because after 60 minutes, uh, it will expire. And for Super LU lesson, let me see whether I can click that. Okay. So, so the first part, I will um, actually do a lot of uh, very basic uh, uh, sparse direct solver, the uh, algorithm tour. Um, and then the uh, second part uh, will be more uh, advanced material. So we'll start with uh, uh, Gaussian elimination, which is the uh, fundamental uh, algorithm in um, direct solver. So you can think about, uh, you know, start with a dense Gaussian elimination, you solve AX equals to B. The way to do that is you decompose into uh, matrix A into the lower triangular matrix, upper triangular matrix. And uh, then once you get two triangular matrices, uh, you do the triangular solve. That's how you can you know, get the solution, each of the solution component. But the Gauss elimination process works, uh, suppose you have a matrix of dimension N, you works one, one step at a time. So the first step, you eliminate the column, the first column, first row. So in matrix notation, you first pivot the element divided into the column here, and then this is the row. Then the remaining part, it's smaller, it's one size smaller. It's n by one, n minus one. But the, that one is updated by the outer product of this uh, v uh, divided by alpha times uh, this row vector, okay? So if you recognize that this is the uh, outer product, uh, it's rank one update. And we call this uh, matrix C as the uh, short complement matrix. So you, um, after you did once, this is first step, then you continue doing this uh, n minus one steps, so you get a lot of uh, short complement matrices on the way. And each one is uh, one smaller if you do column wise. And one thing I want to mention is uh, when people talk about uh, numerical dif difficulty, pivoting, etc., it's uh, mainly because of this uh, pivot element alpha could be very small. 
it depends on your matrix order, right? Uh, so imagine if it's very small, then you divide into a regular number, you get this update matrix uh, has a huge numbers. And this huge number is added into the normal number. It basically wiped out the normal number, the magnitude. So then in the end, your solution will not be accurate. So that's a bad idea. And when people talk about pivoting, it's mainly say we don't we try, try to avoid this small pivot. We can one trick is partial pivoting, which down the column I pick up the best the largest element, swap to the uh, my pivot diagonal uh, element and do this uh, uh, update. So in this way, if you do partial pivoting, then in this way you actually have a factorization of a permuted matrix, uh, which rho is permuted, it's not the original matrix anymore. Okay, so that's a uh, standard uh, trick in the dense linear algebra in LA pack, scalar pack, and nowadays for the exascale machine, the slate uh, software. And then for sparse case, there are some uh, more complication, I'll just mention that, it's not the focus of today's uh, talk. But just to keep that in mind, and then uh, for uh, solving the sparse linear systems, so there are two, two big uh, uh, classes of algorithm, iterative algorithm, which is happening, I think, in another room, and then direct uh, method based on Gauss elimination. There are pros and pa uh, cons of each method. You cannot uh, say which one is the holy grail, or we just ignore the other. So it's all problem dependent. And then for each algorithm, the uh, uh, direct uh, iterative solver, Quillot based, mostly it's SPMV based, so it's uh, relatively easy to optimize, parallelize. And direct solver, the bigger difficulty is uh, the matrix A is actually modified. It changed into LU, so it's uh, not very nice. And in the Quillot, for A is not uh, multi uh, multiply, uh, modified. So um, the combining of this uh, tool is uh, has to be used nowadays for multi-scale, multi multi-physics applications because for those, one of them, either one cannot work purely. So the idea here is that you use, a, find a preconditioner, usually use a direct solver, either approximate factorization that Peter is going to talk about, incomplete factorization or something like that. And then the eigenspectrum of this uh, transformed linear system becomes uh, much nicer. You have a nice uh, clustered uh, you know, eigenvalue, so then uh, your GM rest, for example, Krilov will converge very fast. So now we'll talk about uh, the uh, uh, sparsity. That's the whole focus of this uh, direct solver session. It's not about a dense linear algebra, it's a sparse direct solver. Then uh, talking about sparsity, you, you, there are two, two ways to think about it. Uh, the, very traditionally, you know, people started working on sparse uh, direct solver many, many years ago, maybe 40 or 50 years ago. At that time, we just talk about structural sparsity. So that, that means uh, you can define your matrix uh, as a zero one. You can think about it as a zero one and use a graph to represent that. And then the LU factorization for many, uh, here, here, for many 3D, discrete type PDE, the operation count could be n square. n is your big dimension of the matrix. And if you recall, in the dense case, this is n cube operation. So it's already order of magnitude better uh, in terms of complexity. And more recently, recently say 20, 10 years, um, uh, people started looking into more compressed uh, representation. So this we usually call this the data sparsity. So on the surface, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, matrix, sparse matrix, a lot of blocks uh, looks like dense, or even a dense matrix uh, to begin with. But then you can use uh, some uh, clever representation, especially the problem coming from a phys physics uh, uh, problem. Your long range interaction is very weak. So then you can say, you know, these two points, uh, I can ignore their re uh, interaction. And that's essentially the idea of a fast uh, a multiple to do the uh, particle interaction evaluation. So in that way, even though you physically they are connected, uh, so it's a dense connection, but then after you compress, uh, you can ignore that. So we, 
very typically we use a low rank representation in the matrix form and then you can reduce but of course this factorization will become approximate but as long as you have a clever way to approximate you can get very accurate uh, inexact direct solver but most widely it can be used as a preconditioner so in this way you actually could get a continue to reduce your complexity from n square to order of n with the poly log n say log n log n square or like that so you can see that the i mean with this complexity people basically say it's a nearly linear time so it's a very good in the sense of a, of a sparse direct solver and for two packages so we are talking about uh, today, one is SuperLU, it's only taking about uh, structure sparsity, so it's only in this camp. But StrongPack has the advantage of combining both this, both this two they can do, okay? So I'll spend a few minutes to uh, talk about the, uh, you know, why this, uh, uh, the data structure and why the sparse matrix come from, what kind of pattern, and how can we exploit that? So I have four, I'm eight minutes into, right? Give me, just the one to, seven, so I have until 11.45, right? 11.50. All right. So I, I think a, a lot of people are familiar with uh, uh, the Poisson equation. And uh, for any you know, tutorial, I think in uh, Eureka today's uh, uh, introductory uh, lecture also talks about uh, Poisson equation. And that's the standard uh, model uh, problem we are facing. And this is a two-dimensional case. And then you can use the Stencil equation to discretize. So that means at this point, you have uh, four neighbors. And then when you put in these uh, neighbors uh, uh, into the matrix form, you could see that uh, all these uh, discretized points, uh, they are on the main diagonal of the matrix. And then the uh, four neighbors, uh, they will be the four off diagonal. But to, depending on how you order that, uh, remember I'm talking about ordering. So right now, suppose I order by row, then you will have these two neighbors that will be close together. So these two will be just uh, one off sub diagonal one. But the other two, they are going to be order of k apart. k is your mesh, one dimensional mesh size. Okay, so it's a five diagonal, but two diagonals, they are far apart. All right. So if you do the Gaussian elimination with that pattern, you can see that uh, this is a 25 by 25 matrix. You can see that uh, the blue one are the original non zeros I showed in the previous picture, and then you, in the beginning, you got a sub, several non-zeros they preserved, but uh, all the rest, starting from the several, uh, the six rows here, then it's all become filling. You can do it yourself on paper. You can do smaller matrix. So this one is uh, 25 by 25. So that's the uh, main difficulty for sparse uh, Gaussian elimination. You will get these uh, fillings, which in the beginning are zeros, then become non-zero, and. You want to, so a lot of people are using, in the early days, using band solver, which is uh, you keep everything inside this uh, bandwidth, so uh, they can be filled. So this is the band solver. solver. And nice thing about this, uh, the data structure is uh, simpler, right? It, you know, you just keep the band. Uh, in, it's uh, LAPAC has a band storage. But with this way, you can actually calculate the filling is order of n to the, three half and the flops is the order of n square so that's if you use band solver but on the picture on the right I changed the ordering remember I can swap swap the equations and swap the variables and this particular ordering I'm doing is the minimum degree ordering so you can see that I still have feeling so feeling is unavoidable but it's smaller so in this on the left I have feeling is 223 but on the right, it's only 207. And it doesn't look very nice, the pattern. But uh, when you scale up the problem, in addition to, you know, instead of 25 by 25, 10,000 by 10,000, a million by a million, this gap is huge. 
it's uh, basically the gap will be represented by this algorithm complexity. So, so in this uh, general sparse solver, using, for example, minimum degree Nancy dissection, you get the filling, which filling corresponding to memory, which n log n, and the flops is uh, n to the two, three half. It's much better than band solver. So that's what we're, a goal is to do this general sparse solver. All right, so this picture actually tells all the story about this uh, uh, feeling in sparse LU. And it's a non-symmetric uh, matrix to begin with. It's a seven by seven. And the uh, black dots are the original non-zeros. And then you do the Gaussian elimination, follow this order. Then you can see that the red dot will be generated. So for example, for this red dot, it's generated because of this non-zero and that non-zero. And furthermore, these red dots, they are going to be propagated throughout the elimination. So for example, this red dot is because of that red dot and this black dot. So this is going to be propagated all the way. So then you can see the pattern like in the LU, the triangular factors. In the beginning, it's probably very sparse. So first, the column and row, they are not changed. They are not, I mean, part, pattern is not changed. But when you go further and further down, it's getting more and more filling, more and more denser. So that's the uh, general idea. And the, from computer science point of view, to get all these non-zero pattern, the, the red dots, where are they? It's the tool, it's called a transitive closure. So if you have a directed graph, of a non-symmetric matrix to begin with, you run the transitive closure algorithm, you can get all these uh, uh, red dots. All right, so let's uh, uh, take a look at the uh, representation of the general sparse uh, matrix. As I mentioned, the band solver is easier in terms of storage, but uh, asymptotically, it's, uh, you're doing a lot more work and also store a lot more. So what we, our end goal is to do really, you know, general sparse matrix. So in this picture, I'm showing you a seven by seven sparse matrix and diagonals, they are non-zero and then all the off diagonals, I put some uh, label here. These are non-zeros and this is a non-symmetric uh, general case. And we usually use a compressed row or compressed column storage it's the most popular uh, storage scheme. So in this picture, I will store all the non-zero values. So by this is a compressed row. So it's the first row, second row, third row. So it's first row, second row, third row, like this. It's a linear array, okay? And then corresponding to that, I will store all the column indices. So for example, for, column, for this A element, the A element uh, is here, the column index is four. I need to have this matching so I know where uh, mathematically in matrix what it is. And in addition to that, I will need to have a row pointer corresponding to the beginning of each row of this linearized array. So the row pointer will be, first row will be one, and the third row will start from five, like this. So you can take a look at these uh, templates for the solution of linear systems. And there's a chapter about all the uh, compressed storage for uh, sparse matrices. Uh, depending on the algorithm, it, and maybe depending on the architecture on GPU, maybe some other storage is uh, better. So this is not uh, everything. It's just to uh, give you an idea about uh, how the compressed storage is represented. Usually you, in addition to the value, you need the metadata structure to interpret, to you know, decipher these uh, values. And how do we do this uh, for distributed uh, um, many processes? And one natural way to do this uh, is also adopted by most of the packages like uh, you know, SuperIO StrongPack, uh, PETC, Tridinos, uh, et cetera. So we just, uh, you know, from user point of view, you need to solve AX equals to B. So you need to see, you need to give us A and B. Then we'll turn this B into X, return to you. And internally for direct solver, we have LU. And LU can, is bigger, they are few. And we can have a very complicated data structure internally. But for 
for the most part, you actually don't need to know how LU are stored. You just need to know how AB, X are stored, right? So for A and B, this is the standard way to do that. We do this by partition by block row. So I have three processes here, P1, P0, P1, P2. And what I do here is the first block row give to A, second block row give to B, uh, give to P, P1, so like this. And certainly for B, it's simple. Most of, the time, most of the time, B is a dense matrix, you know, dense vector or dense matrix, depending on whether you have multiple right hand sides. But look at this. What do you do with this uh, on P0, this uh, sparse one? Then you can do the same, your local sparse uh, compressed row storage, as we just uh, looked at. So what you will do here is I'll show you an example. Uh, this is a small five by five example. So I partition into two matrices, P0, P1. So if you look at P1, I have this compressed uh, storage. So I need to know that the number of non-zero local is seven. And my M local, it's a row dimension local, is a three. And then these uh, three arrays, they are just uh, the same as the uh, compressed uh, row storage in the sequential case, which represent these uh, compressed uh, storage. And then I do need to know, for this piece, my first row, it's uh, starting from two. This is the zero-based index in uh, C. So that uh, P0 will have uh, their structure to represent this. So these two data structure, they can be pieced together to, so the solver, we will know with this information, we'll know globally what does the matrix look like. Okay, you only need to, you know, to uh, put in the, your local part for, for the application. Because of, for the application, you don't have storage to store the global matrix on one node. You really just need to input or distribute it. All right, so I will uh, speed up a little bit. Uh, uh, what time do I need to stop? 11.50. 50? 50. 50. 10, 10 minutes, yeah, that's fine. So, so these are the fundamentals, and you can see that uh, with the, you know, you already see this uh, filling and how to do the compressed storage, etc. So then we can talk about uh, the algorithm phases. And to summarize, uh, for sparse Dirac solver, there are different uh, phases. You cannot, uh, it's very different from dense. For the dense, you can go directly into step four, which is numerical, do the LU factorization and triangular solve. But the sparse case, there are a lot of pre-processing step. So the first step is reordering, which I mentioned. It's important. And there are a lot of different algorithms. And once after you reorder, another thing is uh, you have to figure out this, uh, the filling position. So this is called a symbolic factorization. And there are some good algorithms to do that. And another pre-processing step, step is uh, design the data structure to store your this uh, field LU matrix. So those are the steps we need to do before. And numerical pivoting, I mentioned the, in the very beginning, it's important. So partial pivoting, for example, you will, at, when you do the elimination at this step, you will need to swap the biggest element to the diagonal to do the uh, elimination. But this is a sparse case. For dense case, it's not a big deal. But for sparse case, since you have uh, two rows, so they have a different uh, sparsity pattern. Which row do you use for pivoting? It will change the sparsity pattern of this guy. Okay, so, th and so that means if you want to do partial pivoting dynamically, your LU data structure needs to be adapted uh, dynamically. And that's certainly not good because your, your LU, it's, uh, you know, dynamically, you need to get more filling on bigger distributed memory machine. That's not scalable. So that's why these slides, I'm just listing all different uh, strategies for sparse matrices, which you can uh, look later. So usually we use a static pivoting for the bigger uh, distributed memory system. For sequential code, for example, sequential CPLU, we use partial pivoting. So numerically, it's much more stable. Um, very often, if your problem can fit, uh, you know, you can use that uh, to do the uh, numerical analysis, uh, like uh, get the condition number of the matrix, get the, uh, you know, uh, do some uh, numerical analysis. 
But for the distributed least relaxed pivoting code, it's difficult to do numerical analysis. So then ordering I mentioned already, and this is a classical textbook example, which starts, your sparse matrix starts like this pattern. If you do the elimination in this way, it's completely dense, okay? After first step, it's dense. The stroke complement is completely dense. But I just uh, swap the rows and uh, swap the columns, then you do the elimination. So basically, I use two permutation vector here to multiply this. So you start with uh, the arrowhead another way. Then when you do Gaussian elimination, there's no fill. It's a huge difference, uh, ordering, okay? So then the ordering algorithm there are, um, uh, so there's a minimum degree ordering algorithm, and then I will uh, go move uh, fast forward a little bit. And then there's an acid dissection ordering algorithm, which is a top-down approach, uh, which you can uh, read yourself. And the good thing about an acid dissection ordering is for the model problem, the one we talked about, the Poisson equation, you can prove optimality. But for general problem, you cannot uh, prove any optimality, any order equality. It's an NP-complete problem. But only for this special model problem, either 2D or 3D, you can prove uh, optimality. So it's widely used. And it can be generalized to any graph. So this is the uh, nested dissection ordering. For example, this is your starting the mesh. And if, if you do nat natural ordering, it's like that. But if you do nest dissection ordering, the pattern looks like this. Then the filling will be restricted within the separator. All right. So then you can read uh, see the ordering for the uh, non-symmetric pattern matrix. It's getting more complicated. So basically, this slide, uh, what I want to show is that uh, there are different ways, different uh, uh, input matrix could be symmetric or symmetric indefinite or non-symmetric. And it's getting the algorithm code getting more and more complicated. So in the SuperLU, it's doing purely non-symmetric structured matrix. It can preserve a sparsity better, but uh, the code is more complicated. But uh, UMF pack, sorry, strong pack is uh, using the symmetric pattern, which means that the LU, the sparsity pattern is the same, even though the numerical values are different. But the code can be a lot uh, simpler. So in the case of uh, a strong pack, uh, the computational graph is by tree. And in the case of super LU, the computational graph is uh, by uh, uh, directed uh, cyclic graph because it's dealing with a non-symmetric pattern. All right, so then we, uh, in the LU factor, internally, we can exploit uh, the dense structure we call supernode. So then you can leverage, uh, le uh, level up your uh, blast operation into you know, level three blast operation. So then the uh, internally, as I mentioned, that the LU storage is actually very complicated. We, we use this uh, 2D block cyclic layout for LU. And the reason for that is to maintain the scalability, the load balance, uh, and then reduce the communication. And then also, recently, we did a 3D representation internally for LU. Fortunately, you don't need to worry about this. Uh, but uh, from your point of view, you just need to give the grid to tell us what kind of process grid you want to organize. Uh, then internally, we'll do it. And this will reduce the uh, communication by a lot. Uh, so you can strong scale this code we have shown to 24,000 processes, okay? And then we do the GPU, which means that part of the operation is on CPU, majority of the part is on GPU. So the, actually the demo example that you, uh, the exercise you can do is all on GPU. All right, so I will spend uh, two minutes Let's just look at this uh, example. So this is the uh, example on the, uh, the theta GPU that you have access to. And then um, we have a couple of big matrix files, a sparse matrix, so they are stored here. So you set up your environment variable like this. And I want you to run the OpenMP number of threads to be one because there are some complications with uh, more threads. We just want to see pure MPI and uh, GPU. So in this uh, 
picture, this uh, pic, uh, table, I show two matrices. One is torso three, one is the Li uh, 4244. And one is the smaller, the first one is smaller, the second one is the larger. And on the right, uh, uh, on the table here, I'm showing two algorithms. One is the 2D algorithm, one is the 3D algorithm. Okay, so in the 3D algorithm, for example, if you do two processes, then you will need to do one by two. You, you tell me you want a one by two process grid. And for the 3D process, you can do one by one by two, or you can do two. It's not good to have two by one by one because you want a third dimension to have some value to take advantage of or reduce the communication. So this is only a very simple small uh, two process case, two MPI, but with uh, both MPI run on this one GPU, since we get only one GPU node, okay. So let's take a look at the, uh, just uh, look at this uh, green part. Can people see what's the, uh, what can we learn from these two cases, to these uh, four numbers? So from here, from one to two, without uh, this, I said this without GPU, using only CPU, you can see that it's a little bit of reduction of time. It's not quite a factor of two, okay? So that's uh, good news. But vertically, if you see this one process, one MPI, after I add GPU, you can see it's a lot of reduction. This is factorization time. And then if I, for the three dimensional case at GPU, I have more reduction time. Are there any questions about this? All right. Okay, so then the, uh, the solver has a lot of uh, different options that you can choose. Um, you know, all these different option, uh, ordering options, uh, numeric pivoting options, etc. And then you can see this slide. So if you run bigger problem, if you have numerical issue, what are the tips to, um, do, the, uh, to, to do the performance tuning? One of the tools I want to mention is we have this uh, uh, GP Tune. It's uh, automatic uh, performance uh, tuner, which you can use to tune the change the parameters to see how performance on your machine. Okay, so I think I will stop here and there are some other slides you can read. And uh, also the, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, examples are there, you can do exercise yourself. Question? Yeah. Wait, was this in of the second GPU that you were? Yeah, this is on Theta GPU. But why, this, these were the 31 to 28, why, what was the use? So the, you, you were saying that when you passed from... Oh, so, so this is one MPI, this is two MPI. Exactly. Yeah, so that's a good question. That's the question I'm asking. What people have, a, that's a good eye catching this. So the, the thing is, uh, we have only one GPU. And if we use the GPU, then basically a lot of computation is already sped up by GPU. So even if you do two MPI, MPI only works on CPU, right? and then you don't get much benefit anymore. So on the CPU, because the MPI part uh, only work on the CPU, right? So, and these uh, two processes, they mapped onto one GPU. So that's why you don't get much speed up. Because it's two MPIs, but only one GPU. One GPU, oh. yeah, yeah. And also one general comment uh, is uh, uh, for the frontier, for example, the future exascale machine, uh, basically most of the, 90, more than 90% of the computing power are on GPU. So there's no point uh, stressing too much about uh, CPU performance, no matter how many cores. You just, uh, as long as you can put everything on GPU, then you get 90%, more than 90% of the power. So that's why, you know, it's very important to invest on uh, GPU. Okay, so uh, I will now talk about uh, rank structured uh, matrix approximations and rank structured solvers for both dense linear systems and uh, then explain how we can apply that uh, in sparse direct solvers to um, approximate the fill and to develop robust and scalable uh, preconditioners for large sparse scale systems. But we'll start with uh, dense systems. Uh, so let me first introduce the idea of hierarchical matrix approximation, uh, also called H matrix representation, uh, usually denoted by this uh, curly H. 
Uh, this is an idea proposed about 20 years ago by Wolfgang Hackbusch and his collaborators in, in Germany, but it's also been uh, rediscovered multiple times in different fields, which just shows you that there are many applications to this idea. So the idea is as follows. Let's take uh, a large dense matrix, and then you uh, recursively partition this matrix into two by two blocks. And uh, then for each of these uh, four blocks, you can decide, is this block uh, low rank? And then you just approximate it using a low rank product, uh, say U times V transpose, where U and V are uh, tall and skinny matrices. Um, or if you decide that that block is not low rank or cannot be approximated well as a low rank product, then you can uh, again further refine that block into two by two blocks. And then again, for each of these blocks, you decide, is it low rank or not? Uh, and if you keep uh, dividing, at one point, the, the blocks will be uh, so small that it, it no longer pays off to approximate them using low rank, and you can just keep them as dense. So th those are the, the, the square gray blocks here. Those are dense. And these other blocks are approximated using uh, low rank. And there are many applications. For instance, uh, boundary element methods uh, for uh, the solution of integral equations lead to large, dense matrices, which can be approximated using H matrices. And other uh, uh, rank structured uh, problems like Cauchy and Toplitz matrices, uh, they can also be approximated well using this uh, approach. And once you have constructed an H matrix approximation, you can use that to do a fast uh, matrix vector product, for instance, or you could uh, compute a decomposition like a LU decomposition of, of this matrix to do a, an approximate solve, uh, which you could then also use as a preconditioner. Um, but now, how do you decide which of these blocks are approximate, can be approximated as low rank? This is uh, decided using the so-called admissibility condition. But first, you have to define the, the structure, the block structure of the matrix. So you'll need to do some kind of clustering of your uh, spatial degrees of freedom. That's shown uh, here. Suppose you have two uh, spatial clusters, for instance, subparts of your mesh, uh, denoted here by tau and, and sigma. Uh, the, the cluster uh, tau will correspond to, to a set of rows in this matrix, and the cluster sigma will correspond to a set of, uh, uh, sorry, the other way around, uh, columns in the matrix. And then the admissibility condition, uh, one possible admissibility condition is given here. And this compares the, the maximum diameter of these two clusters in, in the uh, physical domain uh, to the distance between these two clusters. And uh, the, intuitively, the farther away these two clusters are, the, the weaker the interaction between these two uh, clusters. So if, if this admissibility condition is satisfied, then we say the corresponding uh, block in the matrix corresponding to the interaction between these two clusters is uh, low rank or can be approximated as low rank. So you'll need to uh, cluster your degrees of freedom and then accordingly uh, permute the matrix. So this defines this uh, clustering of the, of the, of the matrix. Um, but now we can also simplify this admissibility condition and for instance assume that every interaction between two uh, cluster sigma and tau is admissible as long as sigma and tau don't refer to the same uh, block. So that's uh, shown here on the right. In this case, every off-diagonal block is uh, approximated using low rank. So this drastically simplifies the, the, the algorithms and the implementation. It also leads to much more scalable uh, algorithms, also more scalable factorization algorithms, for instance. But it has the, the downside that these, uh, these, the ranks of these off-diagonal blocks can grow quite large, uh, especially for, for higher dimensional problems, uh, like 2D and 3D. Um, but it, it still has uh, applications. Then we can uh, further optimize this uh, format into something called the hierarchically semi-separable uh, approximation. This is shown here on the right. It uses the same admissibility condition as the hierarchically off-diagonal low rank uh, format shown in the previous slide. But now we further uh, compress these uh, off-diagonal blocks here. Uh, now we store them as a triple product, U, B, V transpose, where U and V are uh, tall and skinny matrices, and B is a 
is a small uh, square matrix of, of order the rank times the rank. But uh, instead of explicitly storing this uh, u, uh, we further uh, decompose it and write it as a linear combination of the u matrices of a smaller, a lower level in the, in the hierarchy. For instance, here, uh, this uh, lower left off-diagonal block uh, can be represented as u5 times b52 v2 uh, transpose. But we don't explicitly store u5. We express this u5 as a linear combination of u3 and u4. And this u3, u4 were already used here. It's u4 and here is u3. So we don't need to store them again. We just need to store this u5 hat. Um, doing this complicates the implementation, but it, it, it can reduce the overall asymptotic complexity of the algorithms uh, from order n log n to order n, where n is the, the overall size of the matrix. Uh, and then we're also working on implementation of the block low rank format. This is uh, an even simpler scheme. It's not uh, actually a hierarchical scheme, but it, it's just a, a flat partitioning into a, a 2D uh, grid of blocks. These blocks can be of different sizes. Uh, and we can also have weak admissibility, where every off-diagonal block is assumed to be uh, low rank. Or we can have strong admissibility, in which case we can decide to not compress certain uh, off-diagonal blocks if we uh, know from the, from the physical geometry that those blocks correspond to, to uh, two clusters which are close together. Uh, in practice, this works well, although it has larger asymptotic complexity than, for instance, HSS or, or the more general H format. But it is uh, much more straightforward to implement, also in parallel. So this is a, a quick overview of the different uh, formats. So we have the most general format H. Uh, then we have HODLR, which is using this weak admissibility, so every off-diagonal block is low rank. Then HSS is uh, like HODLR, but we have nested these bases to reduce uh, the complexity from n log n to n. And then there's uh, block low rank. Um, so if you are familiar with the, multi with the fast multiple method, uh, then these things might look somewhat familiar. You can interpret these particle methods like the fast multiple method and barnes hut algebraically using such hierarchical matrix uh, techniques. This is illustrated here uh, on the right. And, and this is a, an a overview of, of the fast multiple method. Um, so if, if you want to compute all pairwise interactions between a set of particles, the naive way to do that would cost you uh, n square, because you have to compare every particle to other, uh, every other particle. But using the fast multiple method, you can do this in uh, linear complexity. Or with barnes hut this would be n log n. So it's somewhat similar to the, uh, uh, to the, the nested basis idea, which we took you from n log n to order n. Um, so now we have yet another uh, rank structured uh, matrix decomposition called butterfly decomposition. And this is based on the complementary low rank property. So here at the top, uh, I'm taking a, a square matrix and partitioning that into uh, several multiple ways. Uh, but in each of these partitions, each block is of size order n. And the complementary low rank property now assumes that each of these block blocks can be approximated using low rank. You can think of these uh, blocks as the interaction between uh, a source corresponding to the rows and an observer corresponding to the columns. So uh, here you would have the interaction between a subblock of the source and a subblock of the observer. Uh, and let's now assume that each of these interactions is of low rank. But then those assumptions will lead you to uh, this multiplicative uh, matrix decomposition known as the butterfly decomposition, illustrated here. Um, so if you have a matrix with uh, this many rows and uh, this many columns, you can write this as a, as a product of block sparse matrices. Um, so um, this is a, a butterfly decomposition of, level, uh, of, of four levels. 
And this is uh, inspired by ideas from the, the fast uh, Fourier transform. So it's uh, specifically motivated for uh, high frequency problems. Uh, uh, we, we, we see that in hierarchical matrix uh, formats, if you have high frequency problems, the, the ranks of the subblocks will often still grow with the frequency, but we can uh, con control that using uh, this scheme. So what we actually do is we consider the uh, hierarchically off-diagonal low-rank format, but then we replace the low-rank part with this butterfly decomposition. So for instance, this large off-diagonal block, instead of approximating this using low rank, uh, where then the rank would grow if we increase the frequency. So now we replace that low rank approximation using a, uh, a two-level butterfly decomposition. And then this smaller off-diagonal block is a, is a one-level butterfly, and this uh, smallest block is uh, a zero-level butterfly, which is just the low rank product. Um, but how do you actually compute these low rank approximations? Uh, one way to do would, this would be using a, a singular value decomposition and then truncating that to a certain uh, threshold. But that's quite expensive. It does give you the, the optimal low rank approximation, but in practice it's too expensive. Another alternative is to use uh, QR with column pivoting or um, rank revealing QR, which is just like uh, QR, but you in every step, pivot the column with the largest norm to the front, and then you end up with this uh, A times pivot uh, permutation matrix is approximately Q times R, uh, and you can also uh, stop uh, after a certain threshold because the diagonal entries of this upper triangular R matrix will be approximations to the singular values of the matrix A. It's not as accurate as the singular value decomposition, but it's a lot cheaper. But both these approaches they need to look at the entire matrix. Um, there are other ways that um, can give you much faster low rank approximation that don't need access to every individual element of the matrix. For instance, adaptive cross approximation, which uh, works as follows. You pick a random column of the matrix, and then you look for the largest element of this column and pick the corresponding row. And that column and that row will give you a rank one approximation of your matrix. And then you, you repeat this process. You pick a next uh, column and a corresponding row, and you add that to your initial rank one approximation to, to end up with a, a rank two approximation. And you can uh, repeat that. It's actually uh, similar uh, to a left-looking LU factorization with rook pivoting. Uh, but you don't need to access every individual element of the matrix. So this can, of course, fail in certain cases when your matrix is, uh, for instance, very sparse uh, and, and you might completely miss the important parts. And then there's also these randomized algorithms, which we actually use a lot uh, in our codes. And they're based on the idea that you uh, take your original matrix A, which you want to approximate using low rank, and you multiply it with a random uh, Gaussian matrix to get a, a much smaller sketch matrix S. And then you can use a rank structured uh, decomposition on this S, for instance, an SVD on, on this S. This is much cheaper than doing, doing it on the original A. So this is a, a hot topic in, in linear algebra right now. And a good overview is, is this uh, SIAM review paper here. Uh, so now, how do we put these uh, rank structured ideas in the sparse solver? Uh, this is briefly illustrated here. So this is the uh, a sparse matrix. Uh, these are actually the, the L and the U factors of a sparse matrix. So it, it includes the fill-in, and this matrix has been reordered using a nested dissection ordering. So you can see at the bottom right here is the, the, the top level separator of your, of your uh, graph. Uh, and then you can uh, see these two sub parts here. So this nested dissection defines a, a hierarchy of, of separators in the graph. And uh, at the bottom right here, we see there's a lot of fill. And now this fill, we can uh, represent that as a, as a dense matrix, or we can use rank structured approximations uh, for that fill. For instance, illustrated here is the, is the top level separator approximated using a hierarchically of diagonal low rank format. And then uh, the separators get smaller and smaller as you keep uh, splitting the domain. Um, and at one point, these blocks will be too small to 
approximate using rank structured formats, so we just keep them as dense. But uh, because there's a whole hierarchy of, of separators and different sizes of, of sub-blocks in the sparse factors, we use actually a combination of different rank structured formats. For the largest blocks, we use the, the format that has the, the lowest asymptotic complexity, like the hierarchically off-diagonal butterfly scheme. For the medium-sized uh, blocks in the sparse factors, we use the, the simpler uh, block low rank scheme, which has uh, worse asymptotic complexity but better uh, constants in the, in the asymptotic complexity. And then for the smallest uh, blocks, we keep them as dense. Or we even have another uh, scheme to compress those using the uh, ZFP uh, compression algorithm, which is a, a little bit like... Um, you could say like a JPEG compression. It's not based on low rank, but it, it can further compress these blocks. Uh, so here are some uh, examples. Uh, so we look at, uh, for instance, high frequency Helmholtz and Maxwell problems. Uh, and then let me show you uh, some numerical results. So here we see, uh, for instance, on the right, the, the memory in, in the sparse tr triangular factors L and U. The blue line is if we do not do, not do any compression, so that would scale as uh, n squared for the traditional sparse direct solver. But by adding this uh, low rank compression, we can reduce this to uh, order n. And also the, the constants are, are much lower. So this line here, the uh, orange line, is a combination of different compression algorithms. And then also for the, uh, the, the time spent in the LU factorization, uh, we see asymptotic gains. So this is all implemented, uh, well, the butterfly part is implemented in a uh, software called Butterfly Pack, uh, and the sparse solvers are implemented in Strumpack, which also links to Butterfly Pack for the hierarchically of diagonal low rank compression and, and the butterfly compression. Uh, so it can be used as a sparse direct solver or as a sparse uh, preconditioner or also directly on, on large dense linear systems. It has some support for uh, GPUs, but not really for the uh, low rank parts yet. We're still working on that. Uh, this is some other available software. Let me uh, very quickly <laughs> show some results. Uh, you can try this on your own. Um, so here, one example here of a, of a dense matrix, a, a dense structured matrix is this Toplitz matrix. Uh, and the elements are defined by this very simple formula here. So all the elements are constant along the diagonals. So the, the value only depends on how far you are from the main diagonal. So this is a very simple structure, but the matrix is fully dense, but it can be uh, approximated very well using, uh, for instance, a, a hierarchically off-diagonal low rank matrix. Uh, so you can you can try to run this. Um, I, I lost my connection. Yeah. So it's just uh, I'll, I'll just uh, show the results in the slides here. Um, so yeah, uh, here are, here are some results. If I run this on a, on a twenty thousand by twenty thousand dense toplitz matrix, and I ask for a low rank compression tolerance uh, relative of ten to the minus four. If I would store this matrix exactly as a dense matrix, it would take about 200 uh, megabyte. But uh, the HODLR representation only takes 2 megabyte. And the, the maximum rank of the off-diagonal blocks is only 12. Um, so you, you can play, for instance, with this uh, tolerance, or you can play with the, the leaf size, which is the, the smallest size blocks. So that's the, the size of the dense diagonal blocks. And, and uh, changing those parameters will, will change this, this rank a little bit. will also change the, uh, the memory. And then here we, we check the error. This step actually takes the longest because here we, we actually uh, form the, the dense matrix to do this, uh, to check this error. Uh, and then we solve a linear system uh, with this matrix using the HODLR representation as a preconditioner. So it, it converges nicely. Uh, convergence will be faster or slower depending on, on the relative tolerance you use here. So now let me uh, quickly show some results for the uh, sparse solver. So we, we have this driver uh, called test mm double, which reads a matrix uh, from the uh, uh, a matrix that's given as a matrix market file. 
you can get these files online from the Switch Spars matrix collection. Uh, the PDE 900 matrix is a small example that's included in, in, the, in the examples folder. It corresponds to a, to a 2D 30 by 30 mesh, so it's, it's quite small. Um, you can run this with, for instance, dash dash help to see many of the options. You can disable GPU or enable it by uh, saying dash dash sp enable GPU. But because this is so small, you, you will likely not see much speed up from the GPU. Uh, but uh, we have some other uh, matrix files in this folder here, which are uh, a lot bigger. Um, and here are some results for, for three matrices. Uh, for instance, these uh, three from the Switch Sparse matrix collection. And here we see uh, some speed ups uh, comparing a single GPU, the A100 on, on the Tether GPU system. And we compare that to 16 uh, CPUs. Uh, these are, I think, Xeon um, cores. Oh, sorry, uh, AMD uh, cores. Uh, the torso system is a bit smaller, but for these two largest systems, we get speed ups of uh, 15 or 16 times. And here on the right, I'm showing the performance in terms of gigaflops per second. So for these larger problems, we get up to 4 teraflops per second using just a single uh, GPU. Uh, and then we have another driver which solves this uh, Poisson equation, which Sherry also introduced, uh, but this is the 3D version. Uh, this is a, a good tool for debugging and we can easily scale the problem size. So 40 corresponds here to a 40 by 40 by 40 mesh. Um, you can play with this dimension uh, and then you can enable uh, different compression techniques, for instance, block low rank or uh, HSS or HODLR you can play with the relative tolerance. So this relative tolerance for the block low rank compression is an important tuning parameter for the preconditioner. So if you enable compression here, the solver is no longer exact. So we run this solver, uh, the triangular solver, within a GMRES uh, iteration, uh, instead of just getting the exact solution after one uh, triangular solve. Um, so here are some results. Um, for this Poisson problem, for uh, 50 cube or 100 cube mesh, uh, without compression or with block low rank compression. And if I don't do any compression here, I disable GPU because we don't have GPU support for the block low rank format. So to keep the comparison fair, I uh, disable GPU here. And you can see um, for the 100 cube problem here, it, it takes 17 seconds for the factorization compared to 51 seconds if we do the exact uh, sparse solver. So that's a nice uh, speed up. Uh, and now you see also that the, uh, the factor memory is drastically reduced from 16 uh, gigabyte to about 5 gigabytes. So it, we only need about 30% of the memory. Uh, but now we no longer get the uh, exact solution after one iteration. So now we need 12 iterations. But if you look at the solve time, which is the time spent in GMRES, uh, it's negligible compared to the time spent in the factorization. But if you need to do many consecutive uh, solves with the same matrix, it might still pay off to do the exact uh, numerical factorization beca because you can amortize this factorization cost over multiple solves. That's, of course, assuming that uh, the exact factorization will fit in memory. If, if it doesn't, then you might still need to apply some compression. And then here, uh, are some results for these uh, sweet sparse matrices I showed before. So torso, geo, and NLP, KKT. Uh, now comparing uh, no compression to block low rank compression in the sparse factors. And again, we see uh, compression of uh, up to 33% uh, of the original exact uh, sparse factors. Uh, and uh, again, nice uh, speed ups. Um, you can, you can compare the speed up to the speed up we got from going from the CPU to the GPU. And actually, uh, you will notice that running the exact solver on the GPU is faster than uh, running this advanced block low rank uh, sparse direct solver. Um, but I would say these two optimizations, uh, uh, the, the GPU implementation and then the advanced uh, block low rank compression, are two orthogonal optimizations. We could um, 
reply board. We we don't have the uh, the the runtime here for the whole solver on the GPU, but ideally we would combine these two uh, optimizations. And this speed up we get here is an asymptotic speed up. So if we just scale the problem large enough, uh, this will still outperform uh, the GPU code because we have asymptotically reduced the the runtime. That's uh, yeah. That's all I have. Any questions? Yes. And by default, it uses the the LU solver as a precondition, or or uh, if you set low. The 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 default is uh, not to do any uh, low rank compression. So use the solver as a as an exact uh, direct solver, but. Um, then we still use the, the, the solver within an iterative refinement loop uh, because we make some compromises uh, with respect to uh, pivoting. We, we're assuming that it's enough to pivot only in the diagonal blocks. Uh, for some very hard problems, that might not be quite enough. So you might need like two or sometimes three iterations of iterative refinement. Um, Is there any analytical result linking how much precision you need to add to the running approximation? Because since there are so many constraints, the strategy is to do it with the act if, 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 if it's actually the direct solver giving you access to precision. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, things are quite complicated, and if we have uh, lower rank approximations in, in one level of this tree here, they will propagate throughout this tree. That 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 is true. Yes, uh, there is some some analysis uh, on this. Uh, I think, for instance, by John Lin Chia from Purdue University um, on on how these errors propagate. Yes, uh, and and when we are doing uh, these hierarchical matrix compressions, we we set typically a, a smaller compression tolerance on the lower levels because we know the errors will accumulate as you go up in the, in the tree. So we, we do take that into account, yes. Can we get the other microphone on? Uh, so, so in the uh, literature, there are some analysis about the error. Usually, it's the error date is the uh, certain amount to propagate. <coughs> so in practice, it's actually very difficult to use. So very quickly, you know, depending on the levels of for this uh, hierarchy, very quickly the bound becomes, uh, you know, too much uh, to be useful. Yeah. Yeah, I had a work with that kind of precondition where I'm just used to uh, using a Uma AMG from Hyper, for instance, and it, it's kind of like you say precondition and does it. And so I was just wondering is there, uh, if I, for instance, do like a simple Laplace equation, is there any incentive for me to switch to something like this, or is it, how does it compare? Like, is it way more performant? Is it, does it save a lot of memory? Or is it just, just something that I shouldn't mix completely? How, how, how does it relate? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I would say typically, uh, if if multigrid works for your problem, it it's it's probably a good bet to stick with yeah multigrid. But um, yeah, for some very hard problems, multigrid might need a lot of tuning. You need to get the right uh, smoother. You need to get the proper coarsening. Uh, there are a lot of tuning parameters, um, and for for the uh, for the things like we were looking at here, uh, these high frequency uh, Helmholtz and Maxwell uh, and indefinite Maxwell problems and so on, multigrid doesn't really work. There, there are some, there's some research on how to make it work, but uh, it's, it's hard uh, and, and we can still solve these problems. Uh, yeah. And I think we have, we also have a lot of tuning parameters, but I think it's a little uh, simpler to tune maybe than multigrid.
Okay, so I guess it's fair to say that once I hit the brick wall with uh, multigrid, then I can start reading into those methods, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. we're trying maybe also to catch up. Uh, I don't know. Th there's been a lot of uh, research devoted to multigrid. Uh, yeah. So the question is, uh, when is a 3D processor grid useful? It seems that a 3D grid causes the algorithm to run slower than 2D. Okay, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, so uh, I think the person uh, is very observing. <laughs> uh, the, this uh, 2D, uh, you can see that the 3D, it's, uh, if you compare the you know, one by one, uh, one by one by one, the 3D code is slightly worse, right, time-wise. The 3D code is uh, a lot more complex. Uh, so for small scale, there's no point using that. It's really for strong scaling. Uh, so for example, if you use uh, 100 uh, MPI processes, you will see, I mean, maybe even 30, or so, you will see benefit. So, so across the board, you can see one by one is worse by one by one by one, and one by two is worse by one by one by two. Right. Thank you.